Well, good afternoon. Uh, it is good to see you here. My name is Costas Panos. I'm a professor of electrical engineering and computer sciences, and also the director of CITRIS and the Banato Institute. And CITRIS stands for Center for Information Technology in the Interest of Society. So it is my pleasure to welcome you here. It is uh, my first time in this auditorium for a while, so it is good to see a crowd here. Really appreciate it. And uh, I would like to acknowledge first the remarkable efforts of the quantum computing at Berkeley Student Club. Uh, clearly, it is uh, because of your enthusiasm and drive that this event is taking place. So, we operate on four campuses at Citrus, on Berkeley, Merced, Santa Cruz, and Davis. Uh, headquarters are here. This is the building of headquarters. And what we try to do is to work to strengthen bridges between world-class laboratory research, state and national policy makers, and industry to help solve society's most pressing problems. We have active projects uh, in the areas of climate, health, aviation, and people and robots. Together with public and private partners, we are shaping the future of information technology in ways that cross traditional boundaries. So we're very pleased to co-host the event today for a couple of reasons. First, we see that as quantum computing becomes a reality, a new very powerful tool will become available to us. We are particularly excited about the potential uh, to, for quantum computing to assist uh, with many pressing problems, especially complex modeling of climate and environmental uh, solutions. Second, we know that quantum computing uh, will become an important growth area in California's economy in the not so distant future. We are very pleased to be partnering with the NSF Challenge Institute for Quantum Computation, which is based here at Berkeley, to connect our young researchers with California-based industries. So I extend a warm, a warm welcome to representatives from industry and look forward to connecting with you. Additionally, I thought that many of you might be interested in learning more about the Citrus Foundry. This is the innovation hub here at Citrus, and we provide access to design, manufacturing, and business development tools to transform entrepreneurial student teams to founders. Uh, the Foundry leverages the resources and expertise inherent in both our local ecosystem and our global collaborators to support new ventures, social enterprises, and tech transfer pathways. So you can learn much more about the Foundry and about Citrus in our website, and I welcome you to do so. So with that, I would like to turn the floor to my colleague, Professor Dan stamberg kern the director of the Challenge Institute for Quantum Computation. Dan? Well, thank you, uh, Kostas. Thanks for partnering with us on this uh, event. You know, the missions uh, of Citrus and of the Challenge Institute for Quantum Computation, or CIQC, are very closely aligned. So I'm sure we're going to find a uh, common cause to organize a lot of uh, other activities in the near future. Thanks also for let us, letting us into your building, um, which was shut for a while. And thanks for letting us be here in person. And on the topic of being in person, it's uh, great to actually see everybody um, for real in three dimensions, like with feet and everything. Uh, the last couple of years have been very strange uh, for all of us. I guess we all got a uh, early preview of the metaverse, and uh, I, for one, found it uh, lacking. Uh, science and uh, scholarship is uh, social activity, and so it's great to be here in the uh, physical company of scholars once again. So I'm Dan stamper Curran. I'm a physics professor here at UC Berkeley. Um, I'm trained as a physicist, and I guess that makes me one of those people that uh, Jack Hidari, as I read in his book, would regard as the old guard, uh, a person who studied uh, classical mechanics before quantum mechanics. Um, but even so, quantum mechanics <clears throat> has become a pretty natural subject for me. I, I teach courses regularly, regularly on quantum mechanics and related topics, and my research work on uh, ultra-cold uh, atomic gases also uh, connects to quantum mechanics quite deeply. I also lead the uh, National Science Foundation-supported Challenge Institute for Quantum Computation, or CIQC. Our mission is to address the fundamental challenges to the realization of the quantum computer. Like Citrus, we're a multi-campus institute, and we bring multiple disciplines together. Our research activities span not only quantum computing per se, 
but also connected topics such as quantum simulation, quantum sensing, uh, technology development, and quantum-inspired classical computing. And uh, also like Citrus, our work is uh, immensely boosted by the remarkable students and postdocs that we get to work with. Uh, many of them are active leaders within the CIQC Community Council or within the Quantum Club at Berkeley. And working with these students and postdocs is inspiring and also uh, very humbling. They are not only the future leaders in the field of quantum information science, but very much they are the current leaders uh, in our institute today. So let me say thank you for your energy, your vision for the future, and of course for pulling together this event. Uh, I also want to welcome our participants, uh, including Jack, who come from the emerging uh, quantum industry. Uh, the work of our institute and of our colleagues in industry is, of course, very linked and interdependent. Uh, we have a lot to learn from our colleagues in industry, and we certainly are relying on them to build the quantum computer when it gets to scale. Um, and conversely, I hope that our industry partners will find benefits from interacting with us, joining in events, uh, joining us, let's say, at the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing or the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics down in UCLA. And I also want to um, invite our industry guests here to connect with us on the possibility of hosting our um, students and also postdocs for internships. I'd really very much like to see our undergraduate students and our graduate students uh, have uh, access to uh, internship uh, experiences in the uh, quantum industry. I think they'll get a lot out of it and you'll get a lot out of interacting with them. So if this is something that is of interest for you to try to arrange, please talk to me or to uh, the CIQC Executive Director, Carolyn Remick, right after the event. I'm uh, particularly grateful to our uh, connections to the Google Quantum team. Um, not only uh, having uh, Jack here, uh, Sergio Boy Bo Boyko is uh, on our external advisory board, so we benefit from his advice. Uh, Austin Fowler was one of the instructors at our uh, CIQC uh, Spring School on error correction and made important contributions there. So. I'm sure we'll find lots of ways to work together. Okay, now let me do what I should always be doing, which is to hand the reins over to our students. Uh, they will give you an overview of quantum computing and set the context for Jack Hidari's talk. So let's uh, please welcome Emilia uh, Direnkova from the EECS department here at Berkeley and also the CIQC Community Council. Welcome. Hello everyone, so great to see everyone. Uh, we had over 500 sign RSVPs to this event. I think a lot of people are joining online as well. So this is really exciting for us uh, QCB leadership. I'm Amelia, I am QCB president and I, uh, I'm here with my marvelous co-presenters, uh, Victor Sambiak and Andres, who will be jumping into the presentation. Um, so before, Jack gets on the stage, um, we wanted to provide context on uh, the basics of quantum computing, but also share all the exciting things that QCB have been up to and also what is going on on Berkeley campus in general. And aside from that, I'm going to be starting with introductory information on quantum computing, but also really wanted to share why is quantum computing so exciting for me as an undergraduate as well. So without further ado, uh, <laughs> I know that this is uh, probably quite a diverse audience in terms of background. So I did want to do a quick poll. Um, how, raise your hand if you know um, which gates you'd have to use to uh, create an entangled pair of qubits. <laughs> All right, great, awesome. <laughs> Then, then most of you are not going to be bored. So it's amazing. So, all right. So why quantum combined with computing? First of all, uh, quantum mechanics is the most successful quantitative theory uh, because really no evidence was shown to disprove the fundamental principles of it. And in, uh, in the kind of forefront of it is Schrodinger's, uh, famous Schrodinger's equation that describes uh, and models uh, microscopic 
uh, microscopic systems such as hydrogen wave, uh, uh, hydrogen wave function. And you can see that for, for those of you in physics, this should be familiar. Um, with uh, these are analytical solutions to uh, the Schrodinger's equation. And even for such small system like hydrogen atom that has only proton and electron, they are already pretty complicated. Uh, and it gets worse when the systems grow. So in fact, there's very little we can actually solve analytically. Uh, and turns out that we even have limits of solving those problems numerically. It actually becomes uh, really hard to simulate quantum mechanics with classical computers. And for that reason, in 1981, Richard Feynman, Feynman gave a talk at a conference uh, about simulating physics with computers. And he famously noted that we should use quantum systems to simulate quantum systems. This is not a direct quote. <laughs> Just, uh, uh, so that is uh, usually regarded as the start of the conversation on quantum comput computers. However, there were papers published before that a uh, couple of years before that talk. So as you can see, the field is pretty new. Uh, however, later uh, in several years, uh, researchers realized that Quantum computing doesn't have to be used just in physics labs for simulating nature. We could actually use them to solve other problems that are really hard to solve on our normal classical computers. And one of the most famous algorithms that excited a lot of people was Shor's algorithm. This algorithm uh, is meant to speed up uh, factoring, uh, factoring numbers and it speeds it up almost exponentially, which is a big deal <laughs> in, in computing. Um, uh, and why do we care about factoring numbers? Well, uh, most of our uh, cryptographic systems uh, use RSA, which relies on the fact that it is uh, really, really hard to factor to, uh, to factor a very large number on a classical computer. So it's just becomes, it just becomes impractical. And uh, for that reason, people were excited but also nervous about this algorithm. Don't worry though, nobody's using a quantum computer to hack into, uh, hack into our computers because uh, we don't have, A, we don't have a large enough quantum computer yet and um, B, there are people already working on post-quantum cryptograph uh, cryptographic algorithms. So, We'll be fine. <laughs> um, and then the next algorithm that uh, is also quite famous uh, is uh, Grover's algorithm by Lov Grover. And that one only provided a quadratic speedup. However, that is still uh, valuable because uh, that algorithm uh, tackles the issue of search, which is used in many different applications. So. Uh, for a lot of a lot for a lot of applications, this speed up is actually enough to make a significant difference for large data sets. And in fact, uh, it was uh, the same year this algorithm was created. It was also shown that this is a lower bound for uh, quantum search algorithms. And it was shown by uh, that paper was co-authored by one of the professors at Berkeley, Umesh Vezirani. All right, so that, those kind of, uh, in 80s and 90s, those floodgates were open and more and more people started coming up with uh, quantum, quantum algorithms for different purposes. So currently the applications go way beyond uh, physical simulations, although those are still pretty important because uh, we can when we can simulate quantum systems, that, we, that means we can uh, use it for material discovery and uh, quantum chemistry. And uh, that uh, has implications in uh, biological sciences and pharmaceutical uh, sciences and material discovery for different purposes. Um, but also there are algorithms to uh, tackle optimization problems. There are, pro uh, there are algorithms to um, 
to improve machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithms as well. So there's definitely a lot of excitement uh, currently around, uh, around the field and uh, we're hoping, uh, everyone hopes that it would uh, really revolutionize a lot of industries. What's the bottleneck? <laughs> why, why hasn't it uh, revolutionized it yet? Well, uh, turns out it's really hard to build a, um, a, fun, a big enough uh, quantum computer. It is currently error prone and we don't have enough qubits. For example, Shor's, to run Shor's algorithm on numbers that uh, uh, actually make a difference, we would need millions of qubits and we don't have that capability just yet. There are multiple companies uh, tackling the challenges of building a quantum computer, computer using different types of uh, physical carriers and you can see some of them here. Uh, and hopefully uh, it, se it seems like the field has been developing really rapidly lately so it is a really exciting time to to be there right now so this was a really brief motivation for what to come and i'm, I'm finally going to move into what dan promised you i would do <laughs> is talk uh, talk a little bit about uh, mathematical foundations of quantum computing I, I did want to give a bit of motivation so that uh, it's not completely uh, math thrown at you out of nowhere. And I like to start with classical computing. That's kind of, uh, it's funny because in, uh, usually in the articles, in these uh, SciComm articles, there is always a paragraph that describes uh, in short what quantum computing is. And that paragraph is usually, usually starts with in classical computing, there is the uh, bit can only be zero and one, but qubit and so on. So I'll start uh, kind of keeping the tradition of that. Um, I will start with that as well. But I did want to point out that learning about quantum computing did make me appreciate uh, how simple uh, classical computing foundations are and how fascinating it is that we could build all these layers of abstraction on top of these really simple concepts that allow us to have our smartphones and uh, super supercomputers in our lab. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully this is, uh, this is familiar that uh, in classical computing, the way we represent the smallest bit of information is with a bit, and uh, the bit can only take uh, values of zero and one. Um, it cannot be both at the same time. And what, uh, what I think is uh, another central piece of uh, classical computation is that we can then use those bits to represent, uh, to represent numbers. And also we have these really well-defined gates that are logical gates um, that are just described by, by this mapping of inputs to outputs, but then what was a really big revelation when I first learned it is that we can use these to then build things like adder. So building an adder, I, I feel like, is what opens up the capabilities of classical computing. And moving from just Boolean, uh, Boolean values and logic to arithmetics. And then we can go on and build, um, and build more complicated things. So we, ha we have, so this is why presentations like this or, uh, artic or articles usually start from talking about qubits, the most fundamental, um, most fundamental bits of uh, information in the quantum computing is because that is the building blocks that we're, go uh, we're hoping to build upon to solve all those interesting problems that I uh, mentioned earlier. So the building block um, of quantum computing is a bit more complicated than classical bit. So qubit uh, or quantum bit can take on, can take on states 
Um, don't worry if you've never seen this notation. Um, kind of, I, I, I like to think of this as learning a new language. Uh, sometimes, especially if you don't come from the physics background, I'm from uh, computer science background. So um, a qubit takes on a value uh, that is almost like simulta simultaneously zero or one, and it uh, has kind of parts of zero and one uh, in it. And what those, uh, what those coefficients represent is actually, uh, they are connected to the probability of what that value is. So, um, there, uh, qubit can also be represented as a vector. And for mathematicians in the audience, that vector is a complex valid vector and in fact, uh, qubit forms a Hilbert space and operations on it are uh, rotations on that space. But that's just if you're familiar with those terms. To, to, bring, uh, to bring back the point that uh, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics is a bit tough to, uh, to simulate on uh, classical computers, uh, it is because each qubit takes on a value that is represented by two numbers. And then once we're trying to combine uh, those, uh, once we're trying to combine multiple qubits, that, that number, uh, that amount of numbers we need to store to represent the qubit grows exponentially. So for two qubits, we have to store coefficients in front of each of the possible values, while classical bits only take on a specific value, uh, a one specific value at a time. So this is why we wanted to have uh, quantum systems to simulate other quantum systems, because kind of we just run out of memory pretty much. But that sounded way too good to be true. If we can store two to the n numbers in only n qubits or four numbers in only two qubits, uh, does that mean we can do computations on all of those numbers at the same time? Well, not really. Uh, we are limited by the act of measurement. And this is why I mentioned that those coefficients are related to probability. Uh, once we have, uh, once we want to actually gain some information about the state of the qubit, the act of measurement collapses the qubit into one of the basis states that are just classical bits, zero or one. And the probability with which this uh, state will be kind of returned uh, is exactly the square, uh, the amplitude squared. So that is the bottleneck of the computation. And however, what most algorithms uh, actually do with that is that we can alter, um, we can tweak these amplitudes in a way that increases the magnitude of the answer that we want. And that is how we're able to get our results. Because in that, uh, if we can increase the probability of the result that we want, uh, then once we measure it, we know what the answer is. So another thing that usually gets mentioned uh, in uh, about quantum computing is entanglement. This concept is easy to understand with math, but, re but is quite counterintuitive if you just think about it without looking at math. Um, because on a mathematical level, it is just inability to factor, uh, factor a state in a way. So 
if we look at this, uh, at this representation and we see that this is our formula for um, combining two qubit states. Uh, this sign here is a tensor product, but in this notation, it only, uh, only really means um, foiling two of these uh, in a way. So what mathematically entanglement mean is that we cannot split these into, uh, into this notation. So we cannot represent these, uh, uh, these coefficients as a kind of product of these. Um, yeah, it makes a, a but what it actually implies is that once we measure this state, uh, once we measure one of the qubits of this state and we get a result, that means that we automatically know what the result of the other qubit is. Because the probability of uh, measuring states 0, 1 or 1, 0 are 0, since we only have um, since we only have the two terms in the formula. So this actually uh, has a, this actually is really important for a lot of the algorithms and it allows us to um, do a lot of uh, needed, uh, needed operations like teleportation, for example. And um, this has been a very important point in the algorithms. So now, okay, we have, so let's summarize a little bit. Uh, qubits are a way we uh, mathematically represent specific uh, simple, quanta uh, simple quantum objects. So, for example, if you're a physicist, you can think of it as an electron with spin one half or a polarized light. So it is a mathematical model uh, to represent those simplest building blocks of computation, and they could represent different things uh, physically. And those usually, um, those physical things usually start out in a specific state. How can we move, uh, move uh, change those states around? Well, mathematically, we represent that with uh, quantum gates. Similarly, how in classical computing, we were able to build an adder with logical gates. Once we define very specific gates, we can add levels of abstraction uh, that allow us to build more complicated things with these quantum gates. Some of the quantum gates are really similar to classical gates. For example, an X gate, um, when acted on the basis state, uh, acts exactly the same way as a NOT gate. What makes it different is that once we um, use it on a qubit that is in a superposition, it is applied to, uh, it is applied linearly. So again, for people with a uh, more mathematical background, gates are actually unitary transformations uh, that act on, on that vector. And what that actually means is that we can apply, um, we can apply that gate to each of the basis states in the superposition separately. So if uh, you, we observe that um, applying X gate to a superposed state with some, uh, ampli uh, with some amplitudes just changes the order of these states. Then there is a, there is a gate that is purely quantum. 
it is completely different uh, from what we have in classical computing, and that really allows us to achieve um, uh, achieve the interesting results that we want. So what happens is that once we apply it to a, one of the basis states, what we get is a uh, equal superposition of those two states. So now measure, uh, measuring uh, either of the states, uh, we can measure either of the states with exactly equal probability of one half. And that is all that Hadamard gate does, uh, but it is not possible in classical computing. So there are definitely more gates uh, to, but in, in summary, gates um, are just well-defined operations or mappings between, uh, the, between, the, basis, uh, between the basis states. Um, from basis, the, there are mappings from basis states to some other, uh, other states. And with those small building blocks, we are able to uh, build more complicated things um, and useful algorithms that I mentioned earlier. For example, a small example is what I asked you at the beginning of the presentation, and that is uh, how do we get the entangled state? You, can, you notice that this is the entangled state I showed earlier, and it only requires two, two gates. One of them is Hadamard that I talked about before, and uh, the other one is C0, and the main idea behind C0 is that it just flips the target qubit if control qubit is one. So it's kind of like an if operation. And it's really fascinating that only with, those, with these two, uh, two gates we're able to get this uh, really weird entangled state. So I know this is nearly not enough to uh, really cover the, the depth and um, give a good understanding of uh, foundations of quantum computing. So there are plenty of great resources out there. And also at the end, hopefully we might have uh, some, some time for questions and I'd be happy to answer any of those. We will be sharing this presentation so uh, you will have access to all, uh, to all the links uh, I have provided. And it is, it is really great that we actually, for undergraduates that are here, we have a class that will be taught next time in the fall, um, and that is Introduction to Quantum Information. And it is a really great class, and hopefully you can take it if you're interested in the topic. And of course, please join QCB, and we would love to have you and talk about these, uh, these topics together and help you understand if you're, uh, if you're learning on your own. So now um, what we wanted to continue with is actually talk about uh, the breadth of things that are going on on campus. Uh, and that is, I'm really excited to hear Samyak uh, share with us. Um, all the great things that you can observe happening on the campus in regards to this industry. Uh, I don't need the point. Okay, so I'm just going to be briefly talking about some of the quantum research efforts on campus. I know as an undergraduate, me personally, uh, coming to Berkeley, I was really excited to take part in research and become involved in you know, uh, the different scientific discovery that's going on. Um, so this is something that uh, is really close to me. So our research on campus uh, related to quantum science covers a pretty wide swath of topics in quantum physics, quantum information, and quantum computing. You know, anything from investigating and developing a new framework for quantum computing, creating new quantum algorithms, to exploring various phenomena in you know, quantum chemistry or quantum biology even. So it's really interesting to see you know, the, the richness of the field and how fast it's growing in the different uh, areas that it's being applied to now. 
So I just wanted to give a brief sort of overview of the different research groups that are there on campus. I know this is something that I would have found really valuable as an incoming undergrad. So, you know, just taking a quick glance at the quantum related research that's being done on campus is, you know, you'll immediately notice that it's, uh, there's an impressive breadth and depth of topics that are being covered. Um, so, uh, and, you know, just a small disclaimer, this obviously isn't the complete list of groups and labs that are on campus, but it's just to give a flavor of the type of work that's being done. Uh, on the theoretical side of things, uh, Professors Whaley group, for example, is primarily focused on looking at quantum many body systems, as well as uh, quantum computation information and control. Uh, with regards to many body systems, they look at uh, investigating quantum biology and strongly correlated electronic systems, to name a few. And on the other research front, uh, they're focused on investigating decoherence, optimal, robust, and quantum control, physical implementations for quantum information processing, uh, development of quantum algorithms suitable for NISC era quantum devices, and quantum error correction, again, to name a few. So as you can see, uh, just a single research group is covering a really large swath of topics, and uh, you know, there's many more such groups. Um, on the experimental side, for example, uh, we have Professor Stamper Kern's lab, which utilizes uh, ultra-cold atoms, ultra-cold molecules, and light to construct quantum mechanical systems to study areas in chemistry, condensed matter physics, and many-body physics. Uh, there's also Professor Hafner's ion trap group, and as the name suggests, uh, they utilize trapped ions to investigate various aspects of quantum physics and quantum information. So as you can see, there's a lot of really interesting research that's happening on campus, and you know, it's enough to strike anyone's fancy, I think. Um, I know Professor Stamper Kern already talked about what CIQC does, but I sort of wanted to elaborate on that point. So you know, extending quantum-related research to beyond Berkeley's campus, uh, the NSF-funded uh, Challenge Institute for Quantum Computation was created as a means to consolidate brain power and foster collaboration for the sole purpose of furthering research related to quantum computing and creating a larger quantum computing uh, community, if you will. As you can see, CIQC has a variety of institutions under its umbrella with distinguished faculty members uh, from each school that are serving as representatives. Uh, in general, though, CIQC is focused on developing three fundamental challenges related to quantum computing. Uh, the first being the, the development of quantum algorithms for current NISC era quantum devices, future fault tolerant quantum devices, and as a means to further develop existing classical algorithms. The next is being able to accurately and rigorously characterize the advantages of quantum computing over its classical counterpart, as well as furthering our understanding of physical science under these NISC era devices for quantum simulations. And lastly, efforts are also focused on the scalability of quantum devices. You know, moving forward, you know, once we have a, a, a fault tolerant working model, a small scale quantum computer, the natural instinct would be to increase the size of this device so that we can implement it for larger and more computationally intensive pro problems. <coughs> Finally, uh, in addition to facilitating research, CIQC, along with the Simons Institute, so now, kind of reports back to the quantum computing community through weekly quantum colloquiums where the latest research in quantum science is presented on and discussed by our various faculty members and graduate students. The quantum gatherings, which I was particularly excited for, you know, it aims to bring together members of the Berkeley quantum science and engineering disciplines to establish stronger connections within the community, invigorate discussions on topics of interest, and hopefully leading to our shared goals for scientific discovery. You know, um, when I first came to learn about this after such a long time of not really being able to see anyone physically, uh, you know, I was really excited to see that, you know, not only do I get the chance to, you know, interact with faculty members and graduate students that are taking part in this interesting research, but, you know, I'm getting to hear their insights on what research they're performing, um, you know, getting to interact with professors on, uh, you know, different classes they may be teaching. So overall, I thought it was a, a really, really great way to sort of uh, consolidate this quantum community. Uh, so now I will have uh, let Andres discuss the past, present, and future of our club, Quantum Computing at Berkeley.
So enough about fancy stuff. Let's actually talk about um, our club. So um, one reason about me talking this club, other than it being a shameless advertisement, is that it's actually something you can do as an undergrad. And I want to tell you that even though quantum computing sounds fancy and mysterious, you can still understand something and even apply it to real life as an undergrad student. So um, here are the four main focus of quantum computing club, it includes reading group, education aspect, community events, and projects. So let's start with the reading group. It is a one hour every Friday reading group that happens on campus every day, every, uh, every semester, where we discuss research papers in various um, uh, fields, including quantum random walks, um, macroscopic superpositions, error correction, and even predicting Mark, Mark crash. So like I was saying earlier, maybe you don't know what's a quantum random walk because it requires uh, some physical uh, physics background knowledge, but I'm, not, I'm sure you, you know what's a market crash, right? Or at least I hope. So we just want to show that even though quantum computing is fancy and it, it's some high level stuff that you might not understand, at least you can, do, you, you, you can use quantum computing to do something that's actually useful in real life, such as predicting a market crash. And um, a second aspect we are focusing on is the education group, which um, we have a beginner study group, which is one hour every Friday in spring 2021. We focus on going over materials on online courses, as well as um, other materials and work on problems that solidify our understanding. At the same time, we also work on a pet project using Qiskit, which can also help us l understand how quantum computing um, in real life works. Um, at the same time, we also had introduction to quantum computing decal in the past. And this is a student organized class that's being offered on campus, organized by quantum computing club. And one um, highlight to say about this semester is we have this quantum error correction school, which is led by our, our friend Victor and Samyak. And Samyak will go over it in, in a bit. Yeah, yeah so uh, we saw this. There was a spring error correction school that was uh, sort of directed towards graduate students, and we saw that, and we thought, you know, quantum error correction is such an important topic for, you know, having these fault tolerant quantum computers. And we thought, you know, I think it would be interesting if we could get some undergrads uh, to, you know, get exposed to this material and try and digest it, because I think, you know, there's a lot to learn there, and it's a really interesting subject. So what we sort of did was we took the topics that were discussed in that school, and we broke it up into three weekends. And we invited various graduate students from Berkeley and other institutions to speak on these topics, such as operator quantum error correction, the surface code, error decoding, and error mitigation. And you know, we we uh, our, our idea was that you know graduate students got this opportunity. Why don't we also see how uh, you know what what can undergraduates do um, with learning uh, with learning about error correction, uh, seeing as it is a very important topic when it comes to um, you know, developing these fault tolerant quantum computers. So, yeah, that, that was sort of uh, our, our idea with introducing this school. So, now I will talk about the community events we have had in the past or, or recently. So, we've been participating in the um, quantum hackathon quite, quite often. And among these, we actually have won the Regalia hackathon in 2018. And we got the overall winner in MIT IQ hack in, in 2021 spring. And we also have uh, regular panels, including the Horizons in Quantum Computing, which we also had in, in the past spring semester. We invited Eleanor Rothner and other um, panelists from uh, other com companies and research groups. And to get involved in the community, we also had a significant effort um, with company visits, for instance, uh, with regular workshops and Google X visit, as well as communications with other tech clubs on campus, including the Association of Women in X workshop as well as um, other lab tours with research groups that Samyak just explained um, a couple minutes ago. So last but not least, we would like to go over some meaningful or, or actual real life applications that we've conducted as undergrad students, hence the projects that we've done in recent years. So first, we did, in 2019 spring, we did the quantum, partial quantum search, which is a variation of Grover's canonical search. Um, up algorithm implemented in PyQuil. And it's some frontier research um, algorithms and that has shown to have a significant speed up comparing to the classical com counterpart. And then we just want to tell you that even as an undergrad student, you can do some research or projects like that. It's fairly achievable. And even though quantum computing sounds fancy, as I was saying earlier, you can still do it as an undergrad student. And um, I'm sure many of you um, here are masters of whack-a-mole. 
But have you ever played a quantum lag back mode? Well, here's the thing. We implemented that in Spring 2021, and that's the project we actually won the um, IQ hack, MIT IQ hack in the spring. And what it is is, other than the name, some, the fancy name quantum like, uh, mark mode, it's a quantum game using a three, quant three qubit quantum system that gives young students an interactive platform to implement the circuit in a common game form. So if you're interested in uh, having a upgraded version of Wagmo, please try this project, and then you can, can learn some quantum circuit in that way. And recently, we've been entering a MaxCut trilogy, which is uh, three projects that we conducted based on quantum algorithm that solves the MaxCut problem. So MaxCut problem is a graph type problem that can minimize or maximize some quantities given the graph inputs. And not to go too further in that, I would just like to introduce three projects that we did significantly associated with MaxCut problem. The first one is the COVID-19 and QAOA project in, in fall 2021, led by our team leader, Victor. And I mean, if I were the CDC, I would invest a lot, huge bucks on this project because it sounds meaningful and it actually it is quite meaningful as we use the quantum annealer to um, this determine how to reopen campus based on the student distance and how to minimize uh, the, um, the student's um, case rate. And another uh, project we conducted recently was a course scheduler in the fall 2021. We used Mexico algorithm to minimize the course conflicts among students on campus. And as Berkeley is a big school, this is actually quite meaningful since it helps um, reduce the course conflicts in, in our everyday life. An ongoing other, another ongoing project was the particle classification in 2021. We used MaxCut Solver as a binary decision classifier to group par particles that share similar properties in the particle physics um, collision. So from the three projects, you can see that um, quantum computing has many re um, real meaningful implications and applications in everyday life, from the COVID that we encounter every day to course scheduler as a student or even higher energy physics side. So as I was saying, and we come back to the point that you as an undergrad, um, you can still con conduct something meaningful with quantum computing, uh, despite you being young and perhaps not have uh, significant physical, uh, physics knowledge, background knowledge. And I would like to invite our um, team leader, Victor, to also explain um, a future or ongoing project that's currently conducted by QCB. So I will hand the mic over to Victor. All right, that is my cue. Awesome. It's about the sweatiest remote control I've ever touched in my life. So the billion dollar question, how can we get started after you know, 40 minutes of introduction to quantum computing and introduction to QCB, right? I mean, the short answer is simply join our club next semester and we'll have a lot of events and research for you. But generally speaking, I'm not, it's not metaphorical when I mean it's a billion dollar question because it actually is. Because without figuring out how can we get started in quantum computing, how can we funnel the talent that this industry so desperately needed? And how can we unlock the billion dollar promise that quantum computing will deliver? So let me help you visualize what does a day in the life of a uh, quantum computing student look like? So here's you, you're a happy Kermit. And one day you're scrolling your phone and you saw, okay, there's an event about introduction to quantum computing and come over it. And you saw Amelia delivering a speech about, you know, introduction to quantum computing and how everybody can do it. And you're sipping your tea, everything's Gucci, right? And then after the event, what happens? Where do you go after the event? Do you know who to talk to? Do you know what resource to use? What books to read? What videos to watch? What tutorial to follow? You don't. You easily get drowned in knowledge and all of the overwhelming resources that are scattered on the web. So that's where you end up. And that's the classic story of quantum computing from baby to giving up. And what is wrong with this process is because there is a lack of community and guidance on the internet. So that is why Entangle Query was formed. We're trying to help you build the quantum future together. What is wrong with the current way of learning about quantum computing on the web is the following. So on one side, you have these open search platforms such as Stack Overflow, Reddit, and Google. And the response is kind of slow, and people will laugh at your dumb questions if you don't ask it properly. But it is easy to search, though, right? But on the other side, you have these private communities, Meetup, Discord, and Slack. You get response relatively fast because it's an instant messaging app, right? But it is a Google black hole. All the Q&A, all the resource on these channels are embedded within these apps, and they don't, they don't get shared on the outside, to the outside world. On top of that, both of the platforms share two common pitfalls. First, they lack a quantum native experience because these platforms, they are not designed 
to be talking about quantum computing. And lastly, they both lack incentives to contribute because we all know that delivering high quality content and answering questions takes a lot of time and people are not properly incentivized to do it. So how is Entangled Query gonna solve this problem? Well, on top of, so in order to enhance the quantum native experience, we first offer the collaborative cir circuit. So with collaborative cir circuit, you will be able to edit circuit, visualize the result, and talk about how each piece of the code is gonna affect the circuit, just like you're talking to your colleagues face to face. And on the other hand, we have the optimized search because what do you think Google is gonna do when you input a bunch of H, Z, and X, right? Nothing meaningful. Because we need to have a search engine, inside search engine, that is specialized for quantum computing terms. And how are we doing? We launched our beta platform, I said about a month ago, and we already have 600 plus users organically from 15 plus countries. And now we're seeing power users from Fidelity Quantum Team, Goldman Sachs Quantum Team, UVA PhDs, and recently we have the global top 10 player in Kiska Challenge to answer a question on our platform. And in the future, this could be even more. We could be sharing events on there, we could be launching open source projects, we could be networking, we could be finding our mentors and mentees. And in the very far future, we're gonna thinking about having this platform in a decentralized governance way because that's the proper way to actually incentivize people to participate in a decentralized Q&A community. So join us and let's build a quantum future together scanning this QR code. And now it's a good time for break before we continue with our next section with Jack. Uh, are there any questions about anything, um, anything that we had in the presentation, either the material that I covered or anything about the club? Um, it was really exciting for us to share everything. So, yes? Well, you know, I, I understand about the gates part. And I come from, uh, you know, where you have a uh, chip and then you have a construction set. And then things happen in a sequence. And each time the clock on the computer goes, things run in a sequence. Things get, you know, taken out of memory, put in a register, something happens, mm -hmm. and the number gets added, something appears on the screen, a low world or something. But in all of the... Uh, things I've seen about quantum computing, I've never seen anything that resembles an instruction set, mm. right? Or what sequence of events things happen, right? So I can, you know, figure out how to add one plus one or come up with hello world on the screen. So do you have any resources that show um, exactly breaking down in a quantum computer how it works with these gates? Mm -hmm. you know, and or not gates, mm -hmm. you know, exactly what sequence of events happens so you can add two numbers or come up with something else for you. Yes, uh, so actually uh, one of the links uh, on the slide goes to Kiskit textbook and I think it's a really good resource in explaining um, first of all, uh, it's a textbook that explains a lot about quantum computing uh, and it's done by IBM, but also IBM has a uh, IBM Q experience uh, platform that allows you to use drag and drop to build quantum circuits and those go in sequence so you put gates in uh, uh, in sequence there is not um, that uh, IBM Q experience is not as complex as you would have in a classical computer because it's still uh, uh, the the way the circuits constructed currently are just kind of like put in logical, it, it, it's an equivalent of in classical computing, putting logic gates together one after another. Um, so you can definitely do that online with IBM Q experience. Um, yeah. Yes. All right, I'm gonna repeat a question for online audience. So he asked about what is quantum control? and what is used for. Which part was? Oh, are you talking about the control oh. gate? So I think so, I'm definitely not an expert on this topic, um, but I think in general what, um, how quantum computing can be leveraged in the control part is because control is really, it's kind of married to optimization, right? And I think quantum computing really accelerates the optimization part, but I personally do not know 
how you know essentially quantum computing helps with the control theory part, um, and that is really you know it really says something that you know we four presenting here we don't know everything about quantum computing right, uh, just because there are so many subfields in this industry that we don't know about, and it really takes a lot of effort to kind of organize and really dig deep into each topic, um, so that you can safely say that you are a semi expert on the topic. Um, so I would encourage you. Uh, perhaps, you know, join a quantum computing team and help us figure out, you know, what other subfields are we kind of missing um, and how can we elaborate on that? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we know it won't be offered this spring. Yeah. Uh, uh, he got a verse. I guess uh, it's not really as much. Uh, I don't think the QR code is working. It says it's oh. reached its scan limit. Oh, oh wow. there's a scan limit. I should have paid for it. Um, so <laughs> the website is just entanglequery.com. Yeah. Anybody, if anybody's interested. Yeah. In the next fall? Yeah. We do not have information on that yet. Uh, right. Yeah. It's already. Um, well, uh, by the way, uh, we, uh, we have uh, Jack Hittery coming in, but I think he is uh, delayed and going to be here at uh, 4.30. However, we have someone from uh, Google here currently, and we also have some representatives from the company. So I think after, after we take uh, several more questions, we can take a break and do a networking um, session together here in the auditorium until mm -hmm. Jack can be here. Yep. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so he asked about what kind of projects is, oh, sorry, what kind of uh, background is required to be part of these projects that we're working on? Um, I would say that we don't really place a hard limit on what kind of background or what major you're in. But what would be really helpful is if you know if you're a major or minor in computer science, physics, mathematics, and chemistry. Sorry, forgot about that. All right. If that's oh yes. So I think she's asking about since you know one of the bottlenecks we talked about about quantum computing is that when you measure the you know the wave function collapses and if there's any other way to kind of measure it so you know situation gets better right um, personally I know there's one field in quantum computing called weak measurement um, so it kind of measures the system with the least amount of disturbance um, kind of preserve the quantumness in a way um, I think Professor Whaley had a project working on that uh, when I was talking to her. Um, one year ago. I'm not sure if that is still ongoing, but I think you should look into weak measurement if you're interested. Yep. Um, I have a quick question. So I know you had uh, mentioned at the beginning that you know, simulating quantum systems with quantum computers can often be a faster way to solve problems. Mm -hmm. So is there any work being done to like, uh, to solve like, really precisely the like, wave equations of more complex systems like molecules or like multi-electron atoms using quantum algorithms? Uh, I believe that is the field of quantum simulation. Yeah, so I don't want to talk about it because I'm pretty sure Jack will want to talk about it um, oh. because he's from Google, right? Um, so I think he will be the best person that you'll hear this from about because uh, they did release in a quantum simulation for a hydrogen experiment. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's take a break, folks. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, so we have some people from industry, maybe uh, we could introduce them real quick so that w everyone knows um, who to talk to. Um, I know Rebecca is here from QSecure. Uh, is there anyone else I'm missing currently? Oh. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Nardo with Qubits uh, Ventures. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, Nardo. <laughs> 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 Okay, and may, uh, there might be some people outside us. So let's um, 
reconvene uh, at 4.30, hopefully when Jack is here, and uh, please feel free to mingle in the auditorium or also in the atrium as well and talk to, uh, talk to our great industry providers. Um, yeah, thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Thank you. Okay. Take our seats. We're going to be starting now. What we've been all waiting for. Thank you so much everyone for staying here and I hope you're as excited for this talk as I am. So without further ado, we have Jack, oh, I'm covering. <laughs> <laughs> I have Jack, Hittery and Stefan from Alphabet and yeah, really excited for the talk. Thank you. All right, folks can hear us? Good, good, excellent. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks to Berkeley and the clubs and Nathan and Amelia and everyone for organizing this today. It's really fun to be in person. I think there's more people than I've seen since the start of COVID in person. So uh, really, really fun to do that and see everybody. I have with me today my colleague, Stefan Leichenauer. Stefan Leichenauer is a Berkeley grad. And uh, what part of your career did you spend here, Stefan? What, what, which part, which stage of your career, of your academic career? PhD and postdoc here. So uh, any questions about future after Berkeley, you can definitely uh, direct those to, uh, to Stefan um, at the end of our talk. Uh, today we're going to talk to you about the quantum frontier. There's a lot more to quantum than just quantum computing. So we're definitely going to talk about quantum computing, but also a lot of other stuff. But speaking of quantum computing, uh, the clubs and um, the students and Nathan asked us to bring a couple of copies of the book. And we're going to be handing these out uh, for asking questions and answering questions during our talk here today. Um, so I'll give you an example. Uh, who can name the three-letter abbreviation of the apparatus that took this picture? Um, what's the full name of that thing? And for bonus credit, what is it exactly a picture of? Which actual thing? What's the name of the thing it's a picture of? So any ideas? Black hole. It's a black hole, yes. <laughs> Event Horizon Telescope, EHD, good. And anyone know the exact specific black hole this is a picture of? Is it the black hole of our galaxy? Of our Milky Way galaxy? Is it that one? No. no, right? So that one's called Sagittarius A star, and it's not that one. Instead, it is, you can check Wikipedia, it's okay. You can use your phone, it's all right. <laughs> it is M87, right? They actually did take pictures of Sagittarius A star, the black hole in the center of our Milky Way galaxy, but they have not revealed those yet. We're all sitting on pins and needles. I know you are thinking about what does Sagittarius A star look like. We are thinking about that very much, but we have to wait till that. So thank you to Johnson. What's your name? John's back. All right, John, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, good. So that's how they work. We have like different questions during this talk. And um, if people answer those, we have some fun books for them. Later, if you want, we can sign them if you want to do that as well. Okay. Uh, so, big picture. Uh, yes, there's quantum computing. We're definitely going to dive into that today. But also, let's think about quantum sensing and quantum communication. So, how did we get here? How did, let's just kind of step back a second here uh, and talk about the path to uh, today. First quantum revolution, 29 people who we only see in black and white. There's a colorized version on the internet. You can check that out. Uh, of people who uh, help create quantum uh, physics uh, due to some crises that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and by 1935, that was essentially canonized. Second quantum revolution, students of those folks, students of students of those folks, quantum physicists who created really interesting objects that we'll talk about in a minute. And then finally, third quantum re revolution is where we are today. And that revolution is not just about the computing, but also about sensing, communications, and simulation. Simulation means when we want to simulate molecular interactions and you want to have drug discovery happen much faster, we want to simulate those that that drug discovery in silico right rather than having to do it with test tubes and right now on average no book for this one sorry but on average how long does it take to develop a drug from start to finish from molecule to medicine average in the united states any 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 ideas on the number of years it takes 10 years, 10 years is a good guess 15. 15 years right so actually right right there so it's about about 13 to 15 years right now to develop molecule to medicine in the united states we think that with this kind of 
uh, computing architectures and hybridized with GPUs and TPUs, we can actually bring that closer in. You still have to do the uh, clinical phase trials, uh, human, human trials, but before that, the seven, eight years before that, we can accelerate using molecular dynamics and simulation in silico. So, uh, map of quantum physics. Um, we're not going to go through all this today, but I want to just highlight the great work of Dominic. I think I have here, here's a picture of Dominic. If you haven't checked out his website of Domain of Science and his videos, please check them out. Really fun uh, cartoons and, and fun videos. He's a PhD in quantum. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, we collaborate with him from time to time to help explain a lot of these interesting concepts. So definitely check that out. But map of quantum physics, the only area that we're going to focus on today a little bit is the upper left-hand corner um, because that upper left-hand corner uh, really led to where we are today. Uh, these are some of the crises that were going on in 1880, 1890, uh, leading up to the year 1900. And the year 1900, uh, which individual, through an act of desperation, uh, started invoking the word quantum to found the field of quantum physics. Which individual was that? And he was in that black and white photo. Which person was that? If you're a professor here, you're not allowed to answer. Max Planck, yes, give this man a book. Yes, good. Um, what's your name? Uh, Sahil. Sahil, excellent, excellent. Good, so Max Planck, out of acts of desperation, said, oh my God, black body radiation, atomic spectra, all these different things that were unexplained. These were experimental data points coming to physicists. Um, actually, starting as, even as early as 1860 with uh, uh, Gustav Kirchhoff, uh, and he's the one who actually invoked the term black body radiation in 1860, leading up to uh, the year 1900 when uh, Max Planck went to his uh, kind of country house outside of Berlin. He was a professor of physics in Berlin. Went outside and, uh, to his country house and said, I've got, got to find some way of explaining all this ballgame. So we won't go into all that today, but really this was very interesting. Today we have a number of crises in physics today. What are some examples of crises in physics today? Things we cannot explain in dark physics energy. today. Sorry? Dark energy. dark energy and dark matter. That's good. Other ideas? Right, exactly. How do we get quantum physics, on the one hand, and general relativity, which helps explain gravity, on the other hand, how do we get these reconciled together, right? Both have a lot of experimental evidence, but can't seem to get these guys to, to talk to each other. Yes, very good. Um, please, another one. Observer effect. Observer effect, right. Measurement, measurement, me measurement problem, observer effect. Yeah, good. Entropy of black hole. Entropy of black hole. Very, very interesting. So, Lenny Susskind... Um, and many others uh, that, uh, and, and right, in, in Stefan's background as well, academically, also thinking deeply about information in black holes, right? How do we think about information in black holes? Black holes may be the fastest and best processors of information in the universe. Kind of weird to think about a black hole that way, but may be the case. And one other one is matter and antimatter. Stefan, what's the issue with matter and antimatter? What's the problem with matter and antimatter? What's the conundrum of matter and antimatter in the universe? And in the beginning of the universe, it was probably supposed to be supposed to be equal in the beginning, but yet it's not. So, what's you know any thoughts on that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> there mystery. it is. So, <laughs> physics does not know why we have more matter now. Without without having a little more matter than antimatter at the beginning, and now a lot more matter than antimatter, we would not be here today. I had a visit to CERN just before. I got there just before COVID. Thank God. Um, and had a visit, and they brought me to the antimatter factory. There is a factory, there's a building at CERN. You can look it up, and you can see it. It's the antimatter factory. Uh, it's, what's that? Yeah, they have, and they have a little, weight, a little contraption that traps the antimatter and holds it. It's a fascinating science, how you trap and hold antimatter, and they produce it, and it's estimated that it's about a trillion dollars uh, for like a gram of this stuff, right? That's kind of like how, you know, the cost of CERN and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but they actually produce and host antimatter in this antimatter factory. It's kind of cool to be in there. But in general, uh, that's a one, another one of the conundrums. So we have a lot of crises right now, which we think will also lead to some interesting breakthroughs in physics. But back then, these were their crises of the time. And these are some examples right here. So we see uh, the absorption spectrum and, and emission spectrum of, of any particular element. It's very discretized. Why is that? Um, that was one of the things. The double slit experiment. Any ideas what year the double slit experiment was first done? 
Any ideas what year, around what year? The double slit experiment. Young was the, first, the guy who did it first. Any ideas? 79 is very close, very close. 1801, 1801. So we had, physicists had 100 years to kind of start contemplating why, what, what was happening with this interference pattern with the double slit experiment. And only much later after the experiment did we start to understand what was going on. So um, here we have, of course, we know Albert Einstein. Uh, and here, without even understanding German, people can kind of get a sense of which one of his uh, fam famous papers from 1905. 1905, of course, was his Annus Mirabilis, his miracle year. He had a number of papers that year. Uh, and which paper did he receive the Nobel Prize for? Was it for special relativity, general relativity? No, for photoelectric effect. Excellent. Very good. And this is, this is the opening of that paper. Now, so again, let's set it up. Um, what was your name again? Sahil set it up with Max Planck, 1900. Uh, and we remember that uh, Max Planck, in an act of desperation, quote unquote, uh, creates the idea of uh, quantization. Uh, and then Albert Einstein, 26 at the time, says, you know what, let me follow on that. Let me give homage to Max Planck and write a paper explaining another one of these unexplained phenomena, these crises, on the photoelectric effect. And he does that and explains it using Max Planck's basic ideas, gives citation to him, and writes his paper. And what does Max Planck do in turn? You think, like, wow, he'd be, like, really uh, impressed by this. He says um, that he, Einstein, this is now, by the way, in a letter, there's a uh, uh, science society that, Ma that Einstein wanted to join, kind of like an academy of science, as it were. And uh, he asked Max Planck for a letter of recommendation. And in general, the letter was quite positive. But he did have this note about Einstein to this society. That he, Einstein, may sometimes have missed the target in his speculations, as, for example, in his hypothesis of light quanta, cannot really help out against him. Uh, and so what, what um, Max Planck was saying is that he didn't believe his paper, Einstein's paper at all, the one paper that got him the Nobel Prize, and which, which really solidified quantum mechanics uh, as a core bedrock of, of modern physics. Uh, but despite that, so kind of like a little lesson for us, that even someone as great as Max Planck um, would have these blind spots. And we see that again and again uh, throughout, throughout history. Here's another example, Wolfgang Pauli, brilliant physicist, um, developer of the exclusion principle, without which I would literally fall through this floor. Um, but, uh, you know, in 1925, uh, they come up with the idea uh, of electron spin to explain what was going on. And they literally, they physically, he, they were in the same room. They came up to him and said, hey, this, this young man, um, Ralph Krone, came up to him and said, he was a postdoc at the time from America, German-American, came over to finish his studies and do postdoc in Germany. And uh, Wolfgang Pauli was visiting that university at that moment. At that time, it was very common for Niels Bohr and Pauli and, and, and Einstein to take trains from city to city. And they would all visit each other. It was a very popular thing to do. Pauli was visiting. And Kronig, kind of in a meek voice, comes up to him and says, um, uh, Herr Pauli, uh, Professor Pauli, I have an idea to explain this other crisis that we have. I think there could be this idea of spin, electron spin. And of course, what does Pauli say? Very clever, of course, nothing to do with reality. Now, of course, we know, you know, spin is a bedrock of what we all talk about today. And unfortunately, Cronin never got the credit for this. Uh, two other uh, young researchers in, um, in Holland got the credit uh, and actually came out with the paper. Cronin was really kind of depressed by Pauli's reaction, so he never actually published uh, that initial idea. And these are the two happy gentlemen who actually came and published the paper. But um, we have other catastrophes that were happening, ultraviolet catastrophe, crisis of how are atoms even stable in the first place? Why don't they just radiate out the energy with the electrons and then fall into the center? Another crisis. So all leading back to this picture. And what is this picture of? What conference was this picture in what year? What conference in what year? You get a book for this one. What conference in what year was this picture? Guesses? Solvay conference, very good, very good. Good start. And now there were five Solvay conferences. Can you name all five years? No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay, so this was very good. 1911, 1911 was this picture here. And this is a picture when uh, Max Planck, who's right here with a little hat, um, our you know, first guy over here, Einstein, of course, right here, Madame Curie over here. We have Niels Bohr over here. We have Max Born here. We have um, Schrodinger here. Always the best dressed, by the way. Any picture you see of physics of the time, see the best dressed dude? It's Schrodinger. Okay, very dapper individual. Very dapper. Um, and, and lots of other greats, all, all in this ballgame here. 
Uh, Heisenberg is over here with the smirk. He's always like a smirk. Every picture under the age of 35 with Heisenberg, he has a smirk on his face. Um, and, and so that really kind of brings us there. And then their students and the students of those students, all quantum physicists said, let's take the theory that was given to us by the greats right before us and create things like the transistor. Uh, these were physicists of Bell Labs. MRI, uh, of course, a quantum device. Laser, a quantum device. So really, really big impact. But of course, now leading us, uh, that was the second quantum revolution, 1940s and 1980s. And now, of course, last two, three years, kicking off the third quantum revolution. A lot of things that we couldn't do in the second revolution, we can now do. And so this combined with AI really leads to the seventh wave overall of overall technology, quantum tech plus AI. So AI alone is very, very powerful. I'm sure many of people here uh, use AI techniques, study AI techniques, but combined with quantum tech, we get a very, very exciting uh, uh, series of possibilities. And uh, around the world, a lot of governments are pouring money in. China, in particular, is pouring a huge amount of money into these areas. Uh, in fact, uh, quantum right now is um, at five times the rate of investment as AI was kind of in a similar year, right before AI really took off with deep learning uh, six, seven years ago. Uh, quantum is already at a great global level investment. And good news for all the students in this room, uh, we think that the supply-demand imbalance in quantum will be even worse than in AI. Uh, so uh, it's a great time to be studying uh, AI, and it's even a greater time to also gain expertise in quantum technologies, because these are very much in demand today already. Just in the last six months, there's been quite a number of quantum companies receiving hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, a number of them going public. What does all that money go for? Some of it goes for hardware, but the most, the majority of that money goes to folks like yourself, right? Goes to hire really, really smart students out of schools like Berkeley. Uh, and we think that the, the supply demand imbalance will be even greater than what we saw in AI. So let's now get to the heart of it, quantum technologies themselves. So a lot of excitement about quantum computing. I'm gonna ask Stefan to help me talk about quantum computing today. We're gonna go into that. But before we do, I wanna highlight two areas that most people do not emphasize, do not really consider and don't really read much about quantum sensing and quantum communications. You can notice from this chart that the number of uh, simultaneously controllable qubits that you really need to get things really going with a quantum computer are in the millions. Uh, and that's probably because of error correction. Uh, the qubits that you hear about today, when you hear about a, a quantum company that's made X number of qubits, those are error prone qubits. Those are not fault tolerant qubits. And to get fault tolerance, to get error correction, we need a ratio of roughly 1,000 to 1, 1,000 physical qubits to get one fault tolerant or logical qubit, right? So when you look at all these press releases come out, you want to have some skepticism around how to read these press releases around this number of qubits, that number of qubits. We are still far away from the kind of impactful quantum computer that will really help us advance a lot of other sciences. A lot of progress being made, really, really good, but there's a lot, a lot more to go. However, quantum sensing and quantum comms, notice what we have here. We do not need millions of qubits to make those happen. We can do those today. In fact, that's what's, that's what's happening right now. So the very thing that makes it difficult to make a qubit, that we have to really protect it, that if a stray photon comes in, if a magnetic field comes in, we have to protect it from all those kind of stimuli because that will decohere, right, our qubit. Then we have to reset the qubit, get it back into coherence, and start our computation again. That very fact, we can flip the script and say, you know what, if it's so sensitive to the outside world, let's make it a sensor. Let's use that same technology, and instead of trying to protect it, let's open it to the world and use it as a very, very good sensor to find out what's happening in regimes that we couldn't do with classical sensors. And so that's the field of quantum sensing. Really got going about 22, 23 year, three years ago in academia places like here in Berkeley and many other places. And uh, we now are taking it into industry, into commercialization today. So this is very, very exciting because unlike quantum computing that again takes many more years before we can get really imp society impactful quantum computation, we can impact society today with quantum sensing. And so this is an area that people may not be as familiar with, but I'm sure you'll all love to wear one of these masks, right? It looks very exciting. This is not a medieval torture device. This is 
um, a very early prototype that obviously needs a product manager. But um, <laughs> this is a 3D printed mask. Um, this is a lab in Nottingham in, in the UK. Um, Seth and I went to visit this lab. Uh, and this is actually one of the grad students who developed it. Uh, and so um, this is a quantum sensing system looking at brain activity. Uh, and it uses this Q-spin technology that we see right here. It's a US company. You can check it out. It's a startup in Boulder, Colorado. Really, really cool company. And it uses this technology to sense what's going on in the magnetic field of the brain. Why does the brain have a magnetic field? Any ideas? It has an electric field. Bingo. Exactly. What's one of the physicists who taught us about this idea that everything that has that is, is electrons, electricity has a magnetic field from the 1800s? Maxwell for sure, and right before him, with an F. Faraday, yep, good, excellent. So every time there's electricity, and of course neurons use electric stimulus, right? It's electrochemical, electrochemical, electrochemical. Um, we have a magnetic field as well, and that's what they are picking up right here in this sensor. So needs a little work in terms of interface, but um, uh, really exciting, and definitely check out the papers of that particular deal. Another way of doing things in terms of um, uh, compared to optically uh, pump uh, magnetometry, which is OPM, which is you see over here, uh, is to use diamonds. Uh, these are diamonds that we grow in the lab, uh, and now we can grow even on commercial scale. And these are diamonds that have that same kind of lattice of carbons, but there's something different about it. What do you guys see that's different about this lattice of carbons? Carbons in the black. You see a nitrogen there, right? And what was the V? What's the V stand for? Vacancy, Vacancy right? Nothing there. And so the electronic configuration, when we say electronic configuration, that is the configuration of the electrons, right, in that vacancy is such that if we pump in energy in the form of, say, green light, about 532 nanometers, um, we're taking it from a ground state to some excited state. And what has to happen, conservation of energy, uh, if we give it energy, what has to happen as it relaxes down? It emits, right? And so it's going to emit in the uh, red spectrum. And we can pick that up, and we can use this also as a very, very sensitive magnetometer. And so a lot of stuff that can be done with NV centers in diamond, as they're called, I encourage everyone here and on Zoom to check out what some of the applications are. Uh, even some interesting papers coming out recently about uh, using uh, a quantum phenomenon to detect objects at a distance. So all kinds of interesting uh, quantum sensing out there. Let me kick off on now quantum computing and then turn to Stefan for some more details on that as well. So this is the quad we're in right now. Actually, let me use my magic spotlight here. Whoa, very dramatic. Whoa, everyone please, at the same time. Whoa, yes. This is a quantum, quantum light pointer. Um, so, well, actually it is quantum, right? It's light, so it is quantum. Um, and, and so right now, the past 70 years of digital, of digital computing work has all been here, right? Classical data processed by classical processes, right? That's, that's where we've been sitting. We're about to enter these three other domains, right? That's what's beginning right now, three other domains of, of computation and of, of data. And the pace is really, really picking up. The cadence is picking up of all these different announcements. These announcements are good for you. If you're a student today, and you have the opportunity to deepen your knowledge of quantum technologies, we call it QIS, quantum information in sciences, then this is the moment to really deepen that and then find a huge amount of demand for your skill set in industry because of all these different mergers and public offerings and different milestones that are being hit right now. Um, uh, and uh, let me turn to Stefan now to explain some of the background on this, and I'll come back in a few minutes after that. Stefan, please. All right, thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, so I'm sure as, as, as everyone here knows or has heard about, the, uh, the basic building block of quantum computing or any of these other quantum technologies is the qubit. Um, the qubit being the analog, the quantum analog of the classical bit. Um, and the, you know, one of the differences, especially shorthand, although it doesn't really capture everything, between you know, the quantum world and the classical world is this idea that in the classical world you're either zero or one. Right. Either, say, the electric charge is present or absent on a capacitor or something. Uh, but in the quantum world, in a qubit, um, we typically like to display the possible states of the qubit on this thing called the block sphere. Um, and any point on the block sphere is allowed. The, the top point uh, being we could label 0, and the, the, you know, the north pole, and then the south pole we could label 1. So 0 and 1 are certainly possibilities. But then there are all these infinitely other infinite other possibilities in between, okay? 
And so there's a lot more going on inside of a qubit than going on inside of a bit. Um, of course, that's not the end of the story. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot more complicated than that, especially because of the issue of measurement, right? Um, when you measure a qubit, uh, when you look at it, you never see that it's any of these you know, infinitely many possibilities. You only see that it's either zero or one, uh, but you see that with different kinds of probabilities, right? And so really the, the trick of quantum computing or the trick of, of any other kind of quantum, quantum technology is to engineer what's happening inside of the qubits so that when you do measure it, it's likely that you'll see a pattern of zeros and ones that is useful to you, right? You want to engineer that probability distribution in such a way that you get a useful pattern of zeros and ones out. Because that's all you'll ever see. You're never going to see this funny quantum state. You're just going to see some zeros and ones. Um, right, so you have the, the possibility of being here, say, but when you measure, you're only ever going to see the zero or the one. Um, and the... Uh, you know, when you, when you look at the, the, the possibilities of quantum states, we call these the, the Hilbert space of quantum states, right? Rather than being just, you know, the possibility zero or one, or say you had, you know, two qubits or two bits or three bits, then you have bit strings that could be, you know, strings of zeros and ones. And the number of possibilities is, you know, two to the n if you have n, n qubits in your register. But of course, in quantum mechanics, the number of possibilities is, in some sense, much higher because rather than just having those discrete number of possibilities, now you can take linear combinations and have probability distributions over those different states. And so there's a lot more going on, okay? There's a lot more going on in the quantum world. And this kind of um, extra, extra power that you have to manipulate those quantum states and work with those probability distributions gives you a bunch of interesting kinds of quantum algorithms that people have thought about. And presumably there's a lot more going on in the, in the world of quantum algorithms that people haven't figured out yet. It's kind of, it's, it's actually kind of interesting that people have been able to do as much as they have without e having the quantum computer around to play with, right? Think about all the advances that have been made in ordinary computing theory or in the, in the, in the world of, you know, computer science since the invention of the computer as, as opposed to before the computers existed, right? There was sort of night and day. Um, but this is, this is a, a brief list of what we have now. So some of the sort of famous algorithms um, up at the top, these are maybe the two, the two most well-known. Grover's algorithm for search and Shor's algorithm um, that is used, can be used for, say, factoring numbers. So um, I guess, so here's a question that maybe, maybe is book worthy. Um, for, for Grover's algorithm, which is, uh, you know, an algorithm that does search, you know, um, faster than any kind of quantum, uh, than any kind of classical algorithm. What is the speed up of Grover's search over, over classical search? Yeah, so the, yeah, root n versus n, all right. You should also explain that to the rest of the audience. What yeah, 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 I'll explain it, I'll, 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 I'll explain What's in a second. Johan. Johan. Johan, all right. Let's pass this book back to Johan. Yeah, so what does that mean? That means if you have a list, of, a list of elements, so let's say you're trying to find like a needle in a haystack, so to speak, and you've got a haystack of n objects, and one of them is special, and you don't know which one it is until you, you have to pick each one up and look at it, right? Well, classically, there's nothing much better to do than just check each one individually, one by one. And so the amount of time it takes, the amount of steps you have to, per, you have to perform, on average, is just going to be n, the, equal to the number of objects in the stack. But quantum mechanically, uh, you know, Grover's algorithm tells you that there's a way to do this um, not with uh, n steps, but with the square root of n steps. Okay, and that sounds a little bit crazy. Um, and, you know, in order to realize why it's not crazy, you have to dive into the, into the, the quantum mechanics of it. But this is, this is a, you know, a substantial, but not, you know, not uh, completely ridiculous kind of speed up over what you, over what you can do classically. Um, so Shor's algorithm, Shor's algorithm is, a, is another one. So this one, this one maybe is more well known. Um, so maybe not for a book, but, but what, is the, <laughs> what, is the, what is the speed up of Shor's algorithm over, over the, over uh, say for factoring? Exponential, exponential, that's right. So for Shor's algorithm, there is, there is no what's called polynomial time algorithm for factoring numbers classically, meaning the, you know, if you look at uh, 
you know the size in the size of the number the the number of the the uh, the you know if you want to factor a large number into its prime factors it takes a really long time uh, classically and that's the basis for a lot of modern cryptography say that it's a hard problem to factor numbers but Shor's algorithm basically takes that problem from being a very hard exponential time down to very easy namely polynomial time so it's an exponential difference, and that's a, bi a big deal. So some of these other algorithms are less well known, and I'm going to highlight now some of the ones at the bottom here. So QAOA, variational quantum eigensolver, uh, these sort of Cubo problems. These are the kinds of problems that um, people are investigating for near-term kinds of quantum computers. Uh, so Shores and Grovers, these are the kinds of algorithms that require millions of qubits that are interacting in a very controlled way, and they require error correction to work properly. Um, and so these are a long ways off. You need really big quantum computers. These down here, especially something like the QAOA, this is something that people are investigating now with moderate sized quantum computers that are just barely starting to get more powerful than their uh, classical counterparts in any kind of problem. Um, and there are ideas to use these kinds of QAOA variational quantum eigensolver type schemes in order to figure out something interesting to do in the near term for quantum computers. Question seven. Yeah. Which one would be useful for molecular simulation? Yeah, so which one will be useful for, so the, it, it's a little bit of a, of a trick question because there are some here which you, we don't know if they're actually gonna be useful or not. But for example, the people like to use the variational quantum eigensolver to try and, the, one of the use cases that people try, try this with is to say find you know, low energy states of molecules and things like that. Whether it's actually gonna be useful in practice or just like a fun thing that you can try and do with a quantum computer, people don't really know. Um, there are more sophisticated algorithms for doing something like quantum chemistry uh, that I think would not fall into the schemes listed here. But um, one, of the, one of the things that's interesting about these kind of near term algorithms and near term quantum computing in general is that nothing is known about whether we're actually gonna find something for near-term quantum computers that will actually be useful in the sense that it'd be something practical to actually do with a quantum computer for a real-life application. Certainly something like Grover's or Shor's when you have a big quantum computer, that's great. But these more near-term algorithms, um, it's an active area of investigation and the jury's still out. Um, so, you know, the ideas that people have for using quantum computers, I mean, basically, you know, if we fast forward 10 years or 15 years to when the quantum computers are big and we can do things like Shor's algorithm or HHL, which is one that I didn't talk about, but the, the kinds of algorithms that require large quantum computers, it'll infect everything. It'll be, you know, similar to how AI and deep learning is getting into every field these days. Quantum computers will be able to do a lot of really interesting stuff when they're big and powerful, um, so maybe 10 years, 15 years from now. Uh, quantum computing in the meantime, before we get to that point, um, is a little bit uh, under investigation. It's, it's actually similar in spirit a lot to AI and deep learning in the sense that nobody knew that deep learning was gonna be useful until they tried it out, right? Um, this is sort of another point coming back to the point about, you know, progress that people made in classical computing before they had the computers available compared to after they had the computers available, right? Before people realized that you could use a GPU to do, you know, to, to run like neural networks, uh, you know, nobody was doing big neural networks for anything. But now after, after the GPU started to become big uh, and people recognized that they could be used and experiments were done and experimentally people figured out that it was useful, that there were useful things you could do, then it really took off, okay? And so that kind of thing, that, that you know, sort of experimental progress in finding useful applications of quantum computing um, could happen uh, basically over the next few years. It's something that a lot of, a lot of people are looking at and um, you know, maybe it's not 100% chance that it'll happen, but it's worth looking into. And a lot of, say, organizations are looking at that kind of thing. Um, I guess I'll mention on the sort of the theoretical side, one recent advance uh, for those of you who are interested all of these kinds of different quantum algorithms, uh, different families of quantum algorithms that have been investigated over the years, there's uh, sort of a new understandings of them that are coming under 
um, a, a kind of a unified approach based on this thing called the quantum singular value transform, um, which was just uh, began to be studied a couple of years ago. And so I recommend um, this, uh, this paper here, Grand Unification of Quantum Algorithms by Ike Chuang and collaborators, if, uh, for those of you who are interested in that. Um, so coming, coming now to physical realizations of quantum computers, there are lots of, you know, there's kind of a race, right, to who, how are you going to make this big scaled quantum computer? And there are lots of different ways you can try and do it. And, you know, maybe, maybe one, one path will get there before any of the others. Maybe it'll be a winner takes all kind of thing. Or maybe it'll be a situation where some technologies are better at one kind of um, one kind of application area, some technologies are better at another kind of application area, maybe there'll be multiple winners. Um, but, you know, for in the meantime, before any of them has crossed that finish line, uh, there are lots of different possibilities that people are looking at. So, um, for example, there's, uh, you know, another example of something that's been in the news. This is a, a brand new startup coming out of uh, Harvard and MIT for, called Quira. Uh, which is looking at neutral atom quantum computing, okay? Um, and so they, m you know, made the public announcement of their 256 uh, qubit programmable simulator, is what they call it. Um, and uh, they're working on, you know, the, here they're drawing a distinction between fully programmable and uh, programmable simulator. So this has to do with, you know, the, di the difference between being able to do anything you want with the qubits versus being able to do only certain things with the qubits. And these different hardware realizations have different advantages in that, the different pros and cons. But there are a lot of different, 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 uh, there are a lot of different uh, ways to try and build a quantum computer. So neutral atom is one of them. Um, superconducting quantum computers are a very popular one with some of the, with you know, Google and IBM, and then Rigetti is another, uh, another startup. Um, IonQ, uh, building using trapped ions. IonQ recently went public. Um, Honeywell recently, uh, uh, recently combined forces with uh, Cambridge Quantum Computing, I believe, um, to, to create a new company. Um, so there's all kinds of, all kinds of uh, interesting activities in, in this area. Um, many of the technologies, like superconducting, superconducting qubits, involve using the, you know, involve going to very low temperatures, using, you know, big fancy experimental setups, um, you know, millikelvin type temperatures and you know, are very challenging to scale, right? Uh, trapped ions, um, you know, here's sort of fun pictures of trapped ion computers using laser traps to you know, keep, keep, the, keep the ions fixed and then you, you engineer things so that the ions talk to each other in interesting ways. And ion Q is kind of the leader in this, field, in this, uh, in this area. Uh, NV center in diamond, this is something that you know, Jack mentioned in the context of sensing earlier. You could also use these things uh, for computing. This is, something that uh, others are looking at as well. Um, unlike some of the other technologies, you know, these NV centers in Diamond, one of the nice things about them is that they don't have to be super cool necessarily in order to do interesting, in order to have interesting quantum effects. I think for NV centers, the, the, uh, um, the emphasis right now is on sensing and coherent communications possibly with using these things, not so much computing, but, but you could if you wanted to. Um, you know, the problem with quantum computing, of course, is that, uh, as, as Jack mentioned before, the noise, right? Whenever you have a, uh, any kind of disturbance to your quantum device or to your qubits, um, it causes what's called decoherence, which means the, um, the probabilities are collapsed. It's the same as if you just looked at, the, if you just looked at it and measured it. And it, it, rather than having this delicate balance of probabilities in your wave function, uh, it's just, it reduces you back to just a string of zeros and ones with nothing interesting happening, okay? And in order to prevent decoherence, it's impossible to build a device that's, it's impossible to build a device that just completely prevents decoherence on the physical hardware level. You just can't do it. Um, the best you can do is you can get to a certain kind of threshold of performance where your qubits are good enough that you can combine them together and say take a thousand qubits that are pretty good and have them combine forces to create one effective logical, it's called uh, perfect qubit. And then that one effective qubit could in principle last forever and be coherent. 
and not run into decoherence problems, even as the qubits that make it up sort of have their individual problems, but you, you sort of fix them up as you do some error correction you know, in time as they, as they start to experience problems and, uh, and, uh, and can fix the problem. But this ratio of like 1,000 to 1 means that there's a lot of overhead to creating these perfect qubits. And that's, that's, a, that's one of the real challenges of quantum computing, because not only do you need, say, thousands of in principle perfect qubits in order to do interesting things with your quantum computer, for each of those, you need another, you need, it, it, each of those needs to be made up of a thousand qubits that are pretty good in order to generate this one perfect qubit. Question? Uh, yes, you said something, uh, I heard you right, correctly. With a thousand qubits, logical and one physical, it can last forever? Yeah, other way around. A thousand physical makes one right, logical. Exactly. Yeah. But it lasts forever? Yeah, it could last forever in principle. Right. That's, 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 that's sort of the point, is the once you've crossed... Once you've crossed the threshold, then you can last. I mean, I'm, I'm, we have to be a little bit hand wavy here. Really, um, you know, the, there's always some probability of error. And really what's happening is every time you, you, you can do this kind of thousand to one ratio multiple times. You could take a thousand qubits and make one qubit that's like, you know, more perfect. And then you could take a thousand of those more perfect qubits and make another, make one that's even more perfect and go on like that. And every time you do one of these steps, you get like a, a huge boost in, you know, perfectness. And so you do that, you know, not too many times and already you've reached effectively forever. Okay. And, and, Seth, and, and Nathan, just to add to what Stefan said, we have to do error correction today in our classical computers, right? So our phones, laptops, right now has error correction. Without error correction, our laptops wouldn't work. Uh, and the good news is in, in transistor land, in classical land, we don't need a thousand to one ratio. That's why our laptops don't weigh 600 pounds. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a very helpful thing. Why do we need error correction in the classical world? Well, there are some interesting sources of error. Any ideas of what a pretty out of this world um, cause of error would be? Solar, yeah. yeah okay. And what kind of particle specifically? Uh, Starts with an M. A muon, yep, exactly. Right, there was actually a, a, um, a device, uh, an electoral device, that um, had an error, and they checked it out, and there was no tampering whatsoever. It was actually one of these errors. They, they realized that it was actually a cosmic ray that popped this, popped this thing in. So it's really fascinating that in the classical world, we need error correction as well. Good news is we don't need this crazy ratio of 1,000 to 1. So back to you, right. And things like muons and cosmic rays are, of course, causing errors in quantum computers as well as classical computers. That's right. But, but in the quantum world, there are lots of other things that cause errors that you don't normally have to think about. Like, for example, the air conditioning turns on. <laughs> and uh, suddenly you've got all kinds of weird stuff happening in your quantum computer because of you know, whatever electromagnetic field is generated by the air conditioning turning on. Um, it's extremely sensitive. You have to worry about it a lot. All right. Some, there, there were some hands raised. Yeah. So uh, in the regular world, we use parity bits and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So what do you use in the quantum? Well, that, that's a good question. So, so, so the question is, how does, how does error correction actually work? So it's, it's and uh, in, the, in the classical world, parity bits is a, is a popular one. So how does, what is parity bits? What does that mean? So... If you had, um, so I'll summarize one version of it. So if you had, rather than having one bit that could either be zero or one, but maybe it gets flipped, and then you know you're like, oh, was it zero or was it or was it one? Did it get flipped? I don't know. Maybe you encode that one bit into three bits or something, and you say all three of them are supposed to be the same. And if one of them gets flipped, then you know that uh, then. You, you've got the other two that tell you that, uh, that it wasn't, uh, you've got the other two that tell you what the error was, right? Because two out of the three, they get to vote. And so the, the, uh, the, the, the sort of the parity has changed of those three bits. And, you know, maybe two of them get flipped. Maybe there are two errors. That'd be prob you know, that would be problematic. But of course, what are the chances that you get two errors? If the chance of one error is small, the chance of two errors is really small. And maybe you could do this with 10 bits or something like that. But you can use redundancy, right? You can use redundancy to... To, to fix things up. That's sort of the basic idea classically. Quantum mechanically, it's actually, 
you know, uh, the basic idea is not that different. You can't just use redundancy um, because you're not, you, you're not allowed to look at, say, the other two bits and let them vote to decide. You're not allowed to look at the three bits and then take a vote to decide what's the right answer because you can never look, right? But what you can do is you can use something a little bit more complicated than just multiplying the bits to you know multiplying several bits. You have to use a more clever scheme. But at the end of the day, the way the error correction schemes work is you have a bunch of bits, right? And the way you tell uh, whether there's an error or not and what the error is is by measuring some aspect of what the of what the bits are doing. So, like for example, measuring the parity would say tell you. If you just measured the parity of the bits, it would tell you whether they agreed or disagreed, but wouldn't tell you what they agreed on. It would just say, yes, or yes they agreed, no they, no, they didn't agree. And so by measuring just the parity, you're not actually measuring the value, so you can preserve the value while testing whether or not they agree. And by, using, uh, by, by looking at things that are slightly more sophisticated versions of the parity, they're called syndromes, error syndromes, um, you can measure whether or not an error has occurred and what the error was without actually seeing what the value was. Because um, if you see what the value is, the value of the register, then you've broken everything because then you've measured. And measuring collapses the wave function. So there are these things called syndromes which you can measure, which tell you if an error has occurred and what kind of error. And then you can correct for it without ever actually seeing what happened, what, 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 the, data was actually, what the data actually was. Um, and so at the, at the kind of hand wavy level, it's not that different from what you might do in classical computing. But it's, a, it's significantly more complicated because in order, to do, you know, in order to do this in a robust way, you need something like you know, modern schemes use, like I said, something like a thousand to one ratio of physical qubits to logical qubits. And there are a lot of, a lot of things besides just parity that you have to look at uh, because there's a lot more going on inside of a qubit besides just zero or one. All right. So moving on. So there are also these like, companies like Q-Control and uh, you know, quantum machines that make a living trying to assist those who are making quantum computers and other kinds of quantum technologies. Right? They're, they're, they're developing these sorts of platforms, uh, software and hardware, the whole point of which is to help other people who are you know, building their own kinds of quantum technologies, whether it's computers or something else, um, helping them uh, control their qubits in a way that's very effective. So like if you want your qubits to do, you know, blank, you want, you want your qubit on the block sphere to rotate like this on the block sphere and not like this, right? How do you know it's supposed to, how do you know how to make it rotate like this and not like this? Um, how do you know how to do this in the most effective way? It's actually a tricky problem if you want to do it in practice, right? And uh, figuring out how to do that, you know, in kind of a way that's automated and hands off um, is, well, there are, there are these companies out there making a living, helping, uh, helping others with this problem. So this is just like a, a sort of a, a secondary industry to the quantum computing itself, is these things like quantum machines and Q-control that are assistance to, uh, to, to, to quantum, uh, quantum development. So, um, yeah, so just to recap, we've got uh, our quantum algorithms, and I didn't mention this before, but the, you know, a, a clever way or a nice way of categorizing these kinds of quantum algorithms in terms of things like exponential time, polynomial time, is in terms of these complexity classes, right? That's sort of a useful way of talking about it. So, um, you know, the, the things that are easy classically are P, P, polynomial time algorithms. Things that are hard classically are, uh, you know, exponential time or things that are not in P. Um, and so one of these kinds of intermediate classes is NP. So, so this might be bookworthy, what BQP right. stands for. Yeah, all right, we'll and get there in a second. it's an explanation of BQP. So NP, NP <laughs> are things that the problem itself might be hard, but checking that you got the right answer is easy. So like factoring numbers might be hard, but checking that, checking that you factor properly is, is pretty simple to do. You just multiply together. So in the quantum world, not, rather than just say B, P and, and NP, uh, we have the, the complexity class BQP, which has this sort of funny relationship to P. But uh, yes, yeah, so this is definitely book worthy. Um, Any what ideas is, out there? What is BQP? So P is polynomial. What is BQP? Yeah? 
Binary quadratic sum. Good guess, not but quite, no. not quite. Yeah. Good. That, that's closer. A, it's, a, it's closer. Q has something to do with quantum. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Very good. Bounded error quantum polynomial. What's your name? What's your name? Andy. Andy. All right. Andy. Woo. Very good. Yeah. So the the quantum polynomial is you know that part is is mostly self-explanatory. So polynomial means it's you know something that can be done relatively quickly and only a polynomial number of steps. Quantum means we're using quantum resources here. And the B stands for bounded error. And the reason why, that, that why the B is in there is because quantum algorithms, like anything to do with quantum computers, are probabilistic, right? At the end of the day, when you make a measurement, you're sampling out of a probability distribution. And so you don't know exactly what you're going to get when you, make, when, you make the, when you complete your algorithm. You're going to get some answer. And like I mentioned before, the, the whole trick is to engineer things so that the probability distribution is weighted toward answers you want to see, or answers that will give you the, the insight into your problem. But maybe, maybe, the answer, maybe the answer was wrong, right? So what, what counts as success if you can sometimes be wrong? Well, what counts as success is if you can bound the error, bounded error quantum polynomial time, and if the error is bounded, say the error is always less than a third, so always at least two thirds of the time, you get the right answer. Well, then, as long as you have that as like a as like a, a a good nugget, then you can just repeat your algorithm, you know, a hundred times, and the chance of error after a hundred times is say one third to the power one hundred, which is like zero. So bounded error quantum polynomial time is the uh, is kind of the threshold for success. All right, very good. Seven, I think we have to. Nathan's telling yeah. us we have to. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. Jump on the let's let's. Uh, Let's, let's move on. Good. Thank you, Sefer. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll just take a few more minutes to wrap up. I uh, just want to mention one other area. So I started with quantum sensing. Stefan took us through quantum uh, computation. Uh, just to note, uh, we recommend that people, you know, within your studies, think about secure communication. Uh, it's super critical in the quantum era to think about how we can do secure communication we can no longer use RSA. Uh, just a quick non-book question. What does RSA stand for? No, but okay, but it's, but it's cool. It rhymes with, rhymes with. <laughs> Revest, Shamir, Edelman. Yes, excellent. Woo, all right. Um, we, but unfortunately, sorry for RSA, we can't use them anymore. Sorry for those three guys. But um, there's lots of other things we can use, and it's a really interesting, fascinating area in terms of how we can do QSC, quantum secure communication. Um, uh, here's, of course, the meme that you should use uh, to all your friends, um, with Shor's algorithm about to tackle uh, Henry Cavill with uh, RSA. Uh, quantum teleportation is possible, not with objects, but with information. Uh, that was shown already 20 years ago, and this is one of the protocols that we've proven and use now today to do uh, this kind of secure communication. Uh, NIST, National Institute of Standard Technology, has now already gone through five years of rounds of uh, accepting software that would be post-quantum crypto, uh, PQC, another fun abbreviation, and round three has already happened with these seven finalists, lattice-based cryptography, coming out um, as one of the key winners. Uh, for those who love studying mathematics, and for anyone here who does not love that, it's time to start loving mathematics because uh, this is the future. Uh, and it's very, very critical that if you can take as many courses as possible in linear algebra, and then a bunch more courses in number theory, and a few more extra courses in lattice-based theory, that would be awesome before you come and apply to Google. Um, because uh, there's a lot of math that you need to make it happen. Don't worry. What we realized at Google is that despite hiring the best of the best, uh, masters and PhD students from Berkeley, from other top universities, we had to start a training course. Stefan and myself has to start a training course, and we teach higher mathematics to Googlers. Uh, we've taught now, I think, well over a thousand, at least a thousand Googlers, maybe a thousand five hundred, two thousand Googlers, higher mathematics, because unfortunately, even at the best universities, unfortunately, people are not taking enough mathematics. Um, one of the things Steph and I want to talk about is our PhD and master's and PhD residency. So while you're getting a master's or PhD program, uh, say here at Berkeley, uh, we love for people to come and spend three, six months with us. Uh, it's super fun. You get to taste what's happening in industry uh, and actually work on really cool cutting edge science, publish papers with us. We have a fun time. 
even during COVID, we have an awesome time uh, doing science and making breakthroughs. And so don't come reach myself or Stefan after this uh, if you're interested in that. Um, Nathan wanted me to mention the book and also not just the book, but the GitHub site, all the code. If you want to get hands on with coding quantum computers and really understanding the stuff, just Google GitHub uh, quantum computing, Hittery, my last name, and you can find this link in case you don't write it down now or come to us after, we'll get you the link. It's also in the book itself. Um, but all the stuff is free online, uh, the code and all that stuff. Just to demonstrate the value of knowing about quantum computing and quantum information sciences, this is the son of one of our colleagues at Google. Uh, he's ready to check out the book, obviously at the age of four. Um, he's checking out the book and then in the moment of epiphany, you can see the knowledge, the knowledge <laughs> as, it, as it just comes in. He's just realizing this is his future. There's no doubt about that. Thank you very much. So I know we have to end here. Seth and I will hang around after we hear some final remarks here. We'll just hang out right here if you want to come up, ask us questions. We're happy to answer those questions and sign the ebooks and things like that. Thanks to Nathan. Thanks to the Quantum Computing Club here at Berkeley. Thanks to all of you. Good night.